Good morning, everyone. I'm Leah Kester. I am the chair of St. Louis Friends of Bethlehem, and I'm on the steering committee for Voices from the Holy Land, and I'm also a Dominican associate. We are committed to truth and compelled to justice. So first, I want to thank Tom McKenzie and Richard Schur for inviting me to come and speak about the transformational experience I had in Palestine. And I also want to thank Kent Tallon for his audiovisual wizardry. <laughs> I was honored in 2017 to be part of the Interfaith Peace Builders Olive Harvest Delegation to Palestine. Interfaith Peace Builders is now called Eyewitness Palestine. Now the photos that I'm going to show you are primarily ones that I took, but there are some that other delegates took, and then I have just a couple from a, a journalist. Now the thing that I'm an expert in is really my own experience. And I can't speak for Palestinians, but I do my best to be a megaphone for them, for their voice. Before I left our hotel in East Jerusalem, a woman from the housekeeping staff came up to me and said, I know who you are and I know why you're here. Please tell the world what's happening to us. And that's a quote. Well, you are the world, and here I am. So it took us less than a day to get from Washington to Tel Aviv. And it's common, you know, when you go to passport control, they ask you, oh, where do you plan to go? Why are you here? All this. But in, in Tel Aviv, they ask you, what's your father's name? What's your grandfather's <coughs> name? Well, who cares? Israel cares because if you have either Arab or Muslim ancestry, you're going to be suspect. Now, most of us were, we had our privilege, our white privilege, and, um, but one of our delegates was a Muslim woman wearing hijab. So they took her to the room and interrogated her for about an hour. And um, she came out white as a ghost, but she made it. And then another one of us, who was actually Jewish, was taken into the room because she had a stamp on her passport from Iran. So she was suspect, but they wouldn't believe that she was Jewish. So she had to recite her bat mitzvah speech in Hebrew before they believed that she was actually Jewish. And then they made her sign a document saying that she would not go to the West Bank. So when she told us this, my first thought was, oh, let's go to the West Bank, see what they're hiding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, we stayed at the Holy Land Hotel in East Jerusalem, and we had a fantastic view of, uh, from our room. And you know, we were in Palestine for only 12 days, but our mission continues here and now to bring that truth to the outside world, because most people just don't know. So I ask you to open your ears and harden not your hearts. Most people around the world, they subscribe to the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you, or at least the biblical morality of love your neighbor as yourself. And I believe that we're called to act on that basic morality. <clears throat> So when you go there, and I hope you do, uh, I, I recommend a guide and um, a driver at least, because you, if you don't have unlimited time, you don't want to waste it figuring out where to go and how to get there. Um, so there's so much to see, you'd be better off just looking out the windows. We saw beautiful ancient stone terraced hillsides. They were built 400 years ago by Palestinians. And they're cultivated with olive trees and vineyards and um, orchards by the ancestral Palestinians for generations, many generations. So if your vehicle has a yellow license plate, that's an Israeli license plate. You can zip from city to city on exclusive elite highways in no time, unimpeded. Now these highways have signage for all of the uh, colonies of settlers along the way, but there's never a mention of the Palestinian built up areas that you see, but you, you can see them visually, but there's no signage and it's not on any map. 
So it's as though the Palestinian cities didn't exist. If your vehicle has green and white plates, that's the Palestinian plates, you have to stop at all of the checkpoints. And they are numerous. Yes, people with medical emergencies have died or given birth at checkpoints, waiting to get through. You may need to pass more than one checkpoint to get to where you're going. You might need to spend the night, and in which case, when you get back, your home could have been declared abandoned property because you were not there overnight and someone else is living in your home and your things are out on the street. And this, this isn't hyperbole, this is happening every day. One of the first places that we visited was a farm called the Tent of Nations. It's owned by a Christian family since 1917. This is Daoud. He is the spokesperson for the family now. This family has had the documents, the paperwork, all the registration fees paid, all the paperwork since 1917. Yet, they are surrounded by colonial settlers. And every year, for the last 25 years, they have been challenged in court for their ownership of this land. Now, everybody knows this is their land. But they're challenged in court because the settlers covet the land and they're hoping to just wear them down financially because it's time and treasure to keep defending yourself. The settlers get unlimited funding from the 501c3 American organizations where people don't really know where their money is going and what their money is doing. They give to this charitable donation. But now the Nassars, that family, they don't have those kind of connections, but they developed them. They appealed to the international community, and the internationals came to their rescue to help them on the farm. Part of the reason they had to come was because the occupation force and the settlers piled some boulders and construction debris across their road. So when, when we went there, we had the bus that we were in had to park outside in front of this barricade and then walk the rest of the way to the farm. So the internationals come and they said, because this, these people on the farm are not permitted to construct anything, that goes for buildings or infrastructure, you know, no running water, no electricity. They can't tap into all that stuff even though it's accessible to the settlers that surround the farm. So we walked there and, um, and we saw everything, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And despite the abuse that this family endures in this situation, um, they, they managed to, to subsist with the help of the internationals. Now, it's called Tent of Nations because since they couldn't construct anything to accommodate all these people coming in, they would bring their tents and whatever. But they were able to construct one large tent, and they became known as the Tent of Nations. So despite all this, at the entrance to the farm, they have painted on this rock in three languages, we refuse to be enemies. We helped to harvest and prune this very tree, and I want you to check out the soil. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Now the family who owned this home where we spent the night, um, they provided us with lunch under the trees. It was fantastic, and that might have been partly the ambiance that contributed to this, but it was it was really great. And that evening we went to the um, Olive Harvest Festival. It's an open air festival at uh, Canaan Fair Trade. Canaan Fair Trade is like a processing uh, concern that all the small farmers bring their olives to to have them pressed and you know, make tapenade and olive oil. So the food was fabulous. And um, kids and adults were just leaping around, dancing dabka, that's their traditional dance. It's really beautiful. And I couldn't get a photo of this because it was in an open field and there was like Klieg lights all around and they were dancing in the middle. So all my pictures looked horrible. I couldn't get a good picture, but it's in my mind forever. Um, I was really touched by their, their good spirit and their samud, how they're, they're really bonded with each other. So besides harvesting olives, 
We helped to clear a new plot of land for another field, and we watered and trimmed trees, planted an olive tree, pruned other trees, and burned the trimmings. But the most important thing that we did is that we stood with the Palestinians to avert any settler attacks, to protect them. So in East Jerusalem, we walked the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross where Jesus trod. And I was with an international group and I was confident that if anything bad happened, not from the Palestinian side, but the settlers are very aggressive. You know, if you're with an Israeli group, you have nothing to worry about because the soldiers are there to protect you all the time, the IDF. So as we zipped along this elite exclusive highway, we could see beautifully landscaped berm parallel with the road, which on the back side is a 30 foot concrete wall. That's on the side that Palestinians see. On the side that tourists and Israelis see, it's got this landscaping. But it's landscaped with pine trees, which are not indigenous. They require lots of water to thrive. And they catch fire very readily. It's pine. And so when they get dry, they, they burn up. So far this year, in 2023, they've had, well, more than 221 um, wildfires. So... It's always a big concern. Recently, they had, oh, maybe six months ago, they had a big one that revealed all of the terraces. The forest burned down, and you could see all the terraces, the stone terraces on the hill. But that's partly why they put the trees there, to obscure evidence of Palestinian uh, building. We saw lots of ruins in the West Bank, and not all are ancient, and nor they the result of a natural disaster. And we stopped to explore uh, a destroyed village called Lifta. It's near Jerusalem. It's in a beautiful valley, and they have a, a spring there. And Lifta was one of the world's continuously inhabited villages ever. I mean, it's significant. It's on the UNESCO World Heritage List. The people who lived here lived there until 1948. The Zionist Stern Gang came and um, terrorized them with some murders, and people fled in fear for their lives. So for the past 75 years, these people are living in surrounding countries, and, and even in Palestine itself, they're internally displaced people, and there are even refugee camps within Israel itself. Someone could be living like five minute walk from their original home and not be permitted to go there. Top of the hill there, that's one of the settlements, one of the colonies. So as we're traveling along this elite exclusive highway, gazing out over all this beautiful scenery, the vista is frequently obscured by the looming walls. And we came to one pumping station, one of the pumping stations, there are many, that pipe water from the aquifer up onto the settlements for their swimming pools and lawns. And what the result of that overpumping is that the aquifer is drying up. So the traditional watering places for wildlife and for the shepherds with their flocks, it, they dry up. You can see the black tubes there that they go across the, the Palestinian lands and but the Palestinians are not allowed to have any of it. And in fact, they have to pay for it if they, if they get any water and they store it in cisterns. Yeah, it's the Israel's permit policy that ensures that uh, no Palestinians get any um, access to the infrastructure. Oh yeah, these are the sheep. Um, you see that one was taken from the bus because we weren't getting out right there. We were driving and there was like two miles of a wall just standing open on either end. The only thing it was separating was the shepherds from their pastures. But you could see the shepherds, you know, they had to just walk around it. So they added another two hours to the work day for the shepherds. So an, an Israeli permit is required in just about every aspect of life. Now, when you go, you've probably all been to an amusement park where you had to wait in line to take a ride and then you get the thrill of the ride. Well, if you're in a checkpoint waiting in line, your thrill is making it through the line 
and then you go to work. Hopefully on time, or if you're at an amusement park, you don't have an appointment or you don't have to clock in. But um, many times they, uh, people are denied entry for an obscure reason that they don't even know, and they can't go to work that day. So, so we went through a checkpoint on foot. It's like a cattle chute. It's got like maybe three or four feet of cinder blocks at the bottom. And then there's this iron cage over the top, and it's long because it zigzags back and forth the way lines do. So if you're an American, though, you can get through on your passport as long as you're not doing it repeatedly. Oh, yes, the single person turnstiles toward the end. They have like airport um, x-ray machines. You have to put everything through, and then you go through the turnstile, and then you have to show your passport. And, you know, even during off hours, it took us some time to do because they were about maybe 18 people in our group. Um, in Ramallah, there's a, a businessman, um, Palestinian American named Sam Bahur, and he spoke with us. And his passport filled up almost immediately because every time he goes through a checkpoint, he has to have another permit and they stamp his passport. And he go, he's a businessman, he goes through every day. So his passport quickly filled up. And then they told him he needed to get they took his passport away from him and said, you need to get a Palestinian green card. So to get this Palestinian green card, it's a magnetic card. It's, I think HP is the one who operates this system and all the equipment. But he said, they told him he had to have a permit to get the green card. So he got the magnetic green card. Every time he goes through, he has to present it, and it has to stand in line to get the, the permit. And doing this every day just ate up his time. So then someone told him, oh, you can get a six month permit. So he inquired about it. Turns out he had to get a permit to get the, per <laughs> to get the permit. I mean, it, it, it was all like, and he showed us all of his identity cards. He had them spread out in front of him like he was playing solitaire. It was, it was absurd. There's even a book about this written by an Israeli lawyer named Yael Berda. And she describes all of this stuff and all the consequences of the permit regime. And it's their excuse to do anything they want. If you lack a permit, they can, no matter how ludicrous, it's just their excuse to do whatever they want. So anyway, Sam Bahur says, the, uh, the best thing that we can do for a Palestinian is to give him a job. So oh, right away I thought, oh gosh, I can't do that. But then I thought about it a little more and I thought, but I can buy fair trade products from Palestine. That's giving someone a job. It's giving something productive work, supporting their endeavors. So. There are many reasons to visit Bethlehem. I felt a real communion with the people who were descendants of the apostles, the original Christians. And then to be in these holy places, to walk on the same stones as, as Jesus. And, but then I was awed by that, but I was also awed by this huge wall. This is the wall in Bethlehem. It's got barbed wire on the top. But it's a little bit more interesting than walls elsewhere because there's really artwork all over it, graffiti. But you know, it's largely an eyesore everywhere. And we visited two refugee camps, and I stayed overnight in one of them in Bethlehem called Dehesha. And at the entrance, they have these photographs of people who have disappeared in military detention. This is a remembrance so people don't forget their loved ones and remind their neighbors of their loved ones. And we even participated in a vigil for four young men who were just detained for administrative detention. In administrative detention, um, they don't charge you with anything. You don't know why you're being detained. And if you have a lawyer, your lawyer can't defend you because he doesn't know it, or she doesn't know what they're defending against because you haven't been accused of anything. You can be in detention for years 
and then they can renew it every six months if they really want to hurt you. So the people in the Palestinians in the camps uh, that we visited are just, they opened their homes to us. They were so generous. In Dehesha, they of course, they don't have running water. So they keep their uh, water in these water tanks on the roof. But it makes really fun target practice for the mm. occupation force to uh, go through. They visit it a couple times a week, several times a week, and use them for target practice. And then they think it's really great fun to watch the people come running out with their buckets and their pans and collecting their precious water. When we did the tour of the camp, they showed us the big concrete tank that refugees had built to protect their water. Well, the occupation force came through with a bazooka and destroyed it. So they, they wreak havoc in other ways as well. Um, the refugee camps are training grounds for the green troops coming in. They're high school graduates. You know, they, they come in green. Well, not really green, but, you know, they, they train them in methods for extracting someone from their home. And they practice on by taking children from their school, from their home, and even from their beds at night. There is a film called Imprisoning a Generation, and then there's another one, uh, Two Kids a Day. We screened imprisoning a generation a couple of years ago. Sister Carla May Streeter was our moderator for that one. It sounds so bizarre, like it sounds unbelievable, but there's footage of this on security cameras. But Selim, probably the oldest Israeli human rights group, and they have cameras posted everywhere. And they have, you know, video footage of all this stuff happening. It's like two o'clock in the morning and these soldiers are dragging out this 10-year-old kid blindfolded and putting him into a vehicle. I'm sad to say this happens regularly. But there is a bit of good news. The good news is that there's an Israeli NGO called Road to Recovery who will drive Palestinians from the checkpoints to hospitals in, in Israel. But the thing is, the Palestinian has to first get through the checkpoint. The um, Project Rosanna has a mobile clinic, and it's run by um, Israeli doctors and nurses and Palestinian doctors and nurses. And they go into the West Bank and give health care. But they even get a, a permit for a, a parent to be able to get through a checkpoint with their sick child. Because otherwise, the child can go through, but the parent is not. So, but. Project Rosanna will help to get uh, a permit for this adult to accompany the child, but it takes 24 hours to get. And if your child is in an emergency, you know, you're faced with this decision. Do I risk the kid's health by not getting him to the hospital right away? Or do I send this three-year-old kid off with strangers? That's, that's a hard decision to make especially if you don't really have a lot of medical expertise that you can you know, base your decision on. Road to Recovery and Project Rosanna, they survive, they're NGOs and they survive on donations. Okay, this is Hebron. This is Tomb of the Patriarchs, the Ibrahimi Mosque. Now, in addition to building the wall throughout the community, they built a wall actually within the mosque. Hebron is divided into two sectors, H1, which is Palestinian, and H2, which is Israeli. And there are about 850 colonial settlers um, occupying. They planted themselves in the middle of the old city, and then they now feel the need for 2,000 occupation soldiers to uh, enforce their claim. So separations are, are built throughout the city such that it disrupts the watershed, the whole natural flow of water. So the streets flood and first floors of the buildings are flooded. And you know when all this happens and there's all the checkpoints, you have, there are a whole bunch of checkpoints right in the city. I asked him, well, how do you get to work? How do you get to school? What if you have to go to the doctor? And he said, we have traveling routes across the rooftops. 
Many of the buildings are close together. Some of them, there's they've positioned planks that you can cross if it's too far to jump. And they're, they're very they're fit people. They're all very fit. But um, where there's a will, there's a way. They, they do what they have to do to do their restoration and repairs. And there is a lot of restoration to be done because the settlers are pretty violent and they've destroyed a lot. So, Issa Amro is Hebron's leading citizen. He is an advocate for nonviolent resistance. Now, when we hear nonviolent resistance, we hear nonviolent resistance. When the occupation force hears nonviolent resistance, they hear resistance. And it's their job to squash any resistance. So they're, all, they're hounding him all the time. He's like the Dr. Martin Luther King or the Gandhi of Palestine. He's really a big guy and he's like a big teddy bear. And he has this giant voice and his stature is just, he, he's their hero, he's their hero. So while he's talking with us, he got a call on his cell phone, informing him that the occupation force is on their way. So he told us, they're gonna take me away, and, but not to worry, one of my um, lieutenants will be here to escort you around. So we're waiting there on the street, and. About 50 yards away, a school let out. And all these little girls, they're like maybe eight or 10 years old, they come pouring out onto the street in these little crisp, clean, blue and white uniforms. And they see Issa Amro and they start chanting, Issa Amro, Issa Amro. And it was like, it was like chimes. And then they saw the soldiers and they became totally mute. So they had been skipping and then they became very demure and just walked you know, stoically passed through the soldiers. So then they did come and they took him away. There he is. While we were waiting there before they actually arrived, the lady next to me asked him, are you afraid of being assassinated? And he said, and this is going to be a quote here, quote, I love living and I love my life. If they kill me, it's the price I gladly pay for the freedom of Palestinians. Uncool. Now the soldiers are, they were a cluster of like five or six high school graduates and with automatic weapons. And uh, they were dwarfed physically and morally by Issa Amro, who was armed with his cell phone. The soldiers drove him away in their military vehicle, um, but he rejoined us later in the market. I was kind of at the end of our group and I could hear behind me all this banter and the shopkeepers and loud voices. I turned around and there he was and all these people were like cheering him. He is really tremendously respected and well regarded. Oh, incidentally, the name Isa is the Arabic translation of Jesus. Since the colonial settlers occupy the upper levels of the buildings in the open air market, chain link fencing had to be stretched over the street to collect the garbage thrown down by the colonial settlers. Um, and this is one of my photographs here. You notice the corrugated sheet metal spread out over the chain link on the top? That's to deflect urine and acid thrown out by the settlers onto the market. Now be sure to wear appropriate clothing when you visit a holy site, especially a mosque. If you're not dressed properly, not to worry, they will provide. <laughs> we visited the last Kathia factory in the world. The Dead Sea is getting deader. The fragile ecology of the area is degraded further by mineral pillaging. And around the Dead Sea, there are the Palestinian land supports beautiful Israeli plantations, abundant with date palms and fig trees. Now, the state of Israel lays claim to any uncultivated land. So, 
Palestinian land is subjected to expropriation because some of it is uncultivated. It is uncultivated for this reason. I don't know if you can read it, but it, it's uh, landmines. It's planted with landmines. Mm -hmm. And even if they are told that the landmines have been cleared, are you going to trust them? Mm -hmm. Okay, our next stop is in Israel. This is an Israeli city <laughs> called Sderot. It's the Israeli community that's nearest Gaza. And in contrast to homes in the occupied Palestinian territories and Gaza, these Israeli homes are more like those in any American suburb, except for the bomb shelters. Um, every home has a bomb shelter. Every playground has a bomb shelter. Every bus stop has a bomb shelter. Now, could you imagine having to live and have bomb shelters everywhere? Now imagine needing a bomb shelter and not having one. Uh, the residents of Stodot are vastly better equipped than, the, uh, than their counterparts in the occupied territories or in Gaza. Two Israelis from an organization called um, The Other Voice spoke with us uh, about life in Stodot and in Gaza. And they told us that, oh, gosh, Gaza is like a big concentration camp or a prison. The population density in Gaza is the highest in the entire world. That's how densely they're packed. And since Israel bombed their only power station, which incidentally is an international war crime, they have like four or five hours of electricity randomly during the day, which means that for cooking, they use open fires and candles to see at night. So the risk of fire is tremendous here. So on the road again, we hit the road north for Jaffa. Uh, this was traveling along our elite exclusive highway. We can get there fairly quickly from Jerusalem. <laughs> and we can pretend that it actually was a land without people for a people without land. But the reality is that in 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were driven off at gunpoint or in fear for their lives and remaining refugee camps in Lebanon, Jordan, and other neighboring countries. But Jaffa is nicknamed Mother of Strangers. It had been a major fishing center, trade center. They had a lot of international travelers from for millennia. I mean, this was like really ancient stuff here. And it was called the Mother of Strangers because they welcomed everybody. Everybody had a place at the table. No more. Um, it's still abundant and beautiful, and it's now an Israeli resort city. This park was once a Palestinian neighborhood, which became a refugee camp for internally displaced Palestinians. And they were displaced a second time when Israel decided to build uh, an artist colony and tourist destination here, just for Israelis. These internally displaced people, you know, they're pe people whose homes have been confiscated or demolished continually since 1948. Now, the land is an abundance of beauty and enough bounty to support both Palestinians and Israelis. The land is big enough to share if people's hearts are big enough to share. At this time, the distribution of resources is extremely lopsided. And the restriction of, of the permit regime, restriction of movement, in, in severely inhibits the development of the Palestinian economy. The exploitation, destruction, and expropriation cause huge losses in the farming sector. And they consider their mere existence to be their resistance. Now, about those ruins that I mentioned earlier, since 1967, an additional 57,000 Palestinians were displaced due to house demolitions, revocation of residency rights, and the construction of the illegal colonies on confiscated Palestinian lands. 15,000 additional people 
have been displaced due to the construction of the wall. Some people call it the wall of annexation, others call it the apartheid wall. But displacement continues to this day. If you're a builder, rather than a destroyer, you can write to your members of Congress and tell them that you want your tax dollars to be spent on productive endeavors, not, not destruction. The United States spends 3.8, more than $3.8 billion every year in military aid to Israel. Now remember, the occupied territories are under military rule. So you are paying for the demolition of homes, health clinics, infrastructure, schools, and you are paying to imprison these children as young as eight years old in military prisons, and you're paying to uproot olive trees and build the wall. The U.S. sends so much military aid to Israel that they even sell the technology and materiel to third countries. Congresswoman Betty McClellan, Democrat from Minnesota, has introduced legislation to promote human rights for Palestinian children living under Israeli military occupation and amends a provision of the Foreign Assistance Act called the Leahy Law, and it prohibits funding for the detention of children in anywhere, any country, and that includes Israel. Now, I mentioned earlier about the inadequacy of Israeli maps and the occupied territories appearing as vast swaths of empty land. Uh, in 2012, the Israel Office of Tourism eliminated all mention of anything Palestinian, and they don't print any evidence of anything. So it's always better to get a Palestinian map because it shows everything that actually is. Um, you can get an app on your phone called iNakba that will show you the 500 or, or so um, Palestinian villages that had been destroyed during the Nakba and that'll give you information about the village and the people and where they went in their displacement. So, we had lunch in the Nakka um, at the home of Bedouin Khalil Alamor. Every one of the United States freshman congressmen gets a free junket to Israel as they take office. Would they have known about the demolition order for the Alamor home and addressed him as number 67. Alamor said when he spoke with us, he said, you would think, this is a quote, you'd think they'd be more sensitive to being known as a number, unquote. Then he showed us this notice and it continues saying, to whom it may concern, we're making you and your family homeless. And although Alamor had a paper deed for his land. He waited for two years, languishing, to build his home, waiting for a permit. So he and his neighbors built their homes. Ah. MacGyver has nothing on these bed ones. They're so creative. But he eventually succeeded, and he had the demolition order nullified. So here in the U.S., if you don't have a permit and you're doing something, construction or rehab or anything, you don't have a permit, the penalty is usually a fine or maybe bringing something up to code. But to render someone homeless and their family destroying everything, it's ludicrously disproportionate. The Israeli lawyer, Yael Berda, like I say, she wrote this book called Living Emergency, and she explains it all, and it's, it's, it's really depressing. Oh. So for a Palestinian to actually get a permit is nearly impossible. And the lack of a permit is the excuse for theft and destruction. Um, and it's not only homes that suffer demolition. Schools, water, sanitation facilities, and <coughs> they've been demolished on grounds for lacking a permit. In 2014, like I said, the, the only power plant in Gaza was bombed twice. And um, I don't know if you can imagine keeping food or medicines refrigerated with only three or four hours of electricity each day. That is a challenge. 
Now remember, they don't have running water and they've got these water tanks up on their roofs. So how do you think the water gets up to the roof? Electric pumps. So not only they're deprived of electricity, deprives them of water. The two health clinics during COVID-19 were demolished for lacking a permit. Now, in, this is a blank photograph here. In the words of Mahmoud Darwish, he who lives depriving others of light drowns in the darkness of his own shadow. It would be a mercy to, to both the Palestinians and Israelis to end the occupation. We visited many places and we had visitors from many other places and two refuseniks came to talk with us and a refusenik is um, a high school graduate who refuses to serve in the Israeli military. And they told us about the sacrifices that these young kids make with their moral decisions. They're, they're conscientious objectors. Now, the, the two, the two refuseniks who spoke with us uh, was a young man and a young woman. They told us that in grade school, they were taught to demonize the other. And then each teenager goes to boot, boot camp to learn martial arts and become sharpshooters. Then each graduate is required to serve one and a half to two years active duty in the military and remain on reserve duty until they're 40 years old. This is important for us here now because the United States and Israel have an exchange program for training civilian police and private security forces in the use of military tactics. Think Ferguson. On the bright side, every year a few hundred high school students graduating uh, become refuseniks. And they suffer prison. They actually send them to prison. And then when they get out, they're ostracized in the society and it's hard for them to find jobs and advanced careers. And remember, these are like 17 or 18 year old kids. They've got their whole lives ahead of them, yet they feel so strongly that they needed to act on their basic morality. And there are several Israeli organizations who support them in their, in their courageous actions. Breaking the silence is a group of ex-IDF, Israeli Defense Force, military, who decided to break the silence and, and tell people the heinous things that they are expected to perform when they're in the military. And they, they speak out. And they, they, several of them have been on tour and have come to St. Louis um, and, and spoken about some of these things. They protest the treatment of Palestinians because they know it's not right. The pilots group led by Yonatan Shapira um, refused to bomb. He was a, he had one of the pilots and he organized them, a group of them, to refuse to fly. And since the, that, he, that was prompted by an attack on a refugee camp in Gaza. Incidentally, Yonatan Shapira can't get a job in Israel. He's, pr he's probably, well, I don't know how old he is now, but um, he lives in Norway and he's, he's still a professional pilot. And he's, he flies commercial routes. So, um, so I read these things in, in newsletters from the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, that's UNRWA, um, human rights NGOs and publications from both Israeli and Palestinian sources. <laughs> and not in American mainstream media. Now, if our U.S. congressman saw the same things that I saw in 2017, while I was uh, on their Israeli junket while I was there, um, I cannot believe they would claim to share Israeli values. 
In 2017, I thought the situation couldn't possibly get worse. It did. In July of 2018, Israel passed their nation state law, which codifies Jewish supremacy as a national goal. And I suppose there are some Americans who share that goal of supremacy of one religion or ethnicity, but I'm not one of them. So why would the housekeeping staff at our hotel ask me to tell the world about the Palestinian flight? Think about what's going on with the imprisoning of the children. There are 500 to 700 children under the age of 17 in military prisons. Well, in military detention, kind of a euphemism. Uh, the children are not permitted to have an adult accompany them to jail, much less a lawyer. And after they're detained, they're subject to all kinds of abuse. The children are eventually presented with a paper that they're indicated they need to sign. It's all in Hebrew, so they can't read it. They don't know what it says, but it usually says they were throwing stones. It's a confession. So they sign it thinking this nightmare is going to end. In the Belata refugee camp, they have a staff of psychologists who train the children for the eventuality when they will be captured or, or detained. And they teach them how to conduct themselves, how to prepare themselves mentally, and how to get through the trauma. And then they have um, trauma sessions afterward, after the kid gets out. Now, I don't know if you remember being in high school or, or even grade school when you were sick or something and you missed three or four days of school. I don't know about you, but I always felt a little, some anxiety and catching up. I had missed so much and I, I felt on my, on my back foot all the time. So can you imagine missing four years of school or six months of school? I mean, this really poses a challenge for the youth. And they're, sometimes they didn't do anything. There's but some video coverage of this too. A kid standing there, military truck comes by, the soldiers jump out and grab him. And he's just standing there. Oh, well, the PTSD there means perpetual uh, traumatic distress disorder. So I talked about administrative detention. Um, they're kept in jail with no need to accuse them of anything, no charges. So, but the ama amazingly, the Palestinians that I spoke with were incredibly upbeat and cheerful. And I have to think that it's because they appreciate whatever good things they have in their lives every day. All the little things, they're significant. Um, the bonding with their friends and neighbors and their family, that they can handle this. It, it would challenge me for sure. But in conclusion, it's the interest of the Israelis to project the image of a democracy besieged by hostile anti-Semitic forces, not that of an apartheid regime. Who do you think is facing the existential threat? Thank you for your attention.